Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'm Uli Baer. I'm a professor at New York University and the director of the Center for the Humanities. And it's really a great joy and pleasure to introduce today's event. Uh, I want to thank Kyla Bowen and Molly Rogers for setting it up and working with us to get all of you into this room to have a conversation today and listen to Pamela Sneed and Karen Finley. And I really couldn't be more excited um, to welcome the two of you. So uh, Pamela Sneed is a poet, writer, performer, professor, and visual artist uh, whose books have won great acclaim and influenced and shaped the way we think about who we are today as creative people, as Americans, as human beings. Um, they include Imagine Being More Afraid of Freedom and of, Than of Slavery. Sorry, Imagine Being More Afraid of Freedom Than of Slavery, Kong and Other Works, Sweet Dreams, and the book that we're discussing and celebrating today, which is Funeral Diva, with a cover that is actually a work by Pamela herself. So you can obtain this book. We'll put the link in the chat right now, published by City Lights. Uh, just a few weeks or months ago. So we're here to celebrate and acknowledge this book. Pamela has also been nominated to, for two Pushcart Prizes in Poetry. She's performed widely at the Whitney Museum, Brooklyn Museum, the Poetry Project, the Highline, the New Museum, MoMA, the Broad Museum, and the Toronto Biennial. She's been the keynote speaker at many events. And she teaches, has taught as a visiting critic at Yale University, at Columbia University, and is online faculty at Chicago School of the Art Institute. Uh, she's also teaching at SAIC. And uh, right now, an essay or discussion will come out in Freeze Magazine on HIV and uh, COVID. And there is another event tomorrow. So please look up what Pamela is up to. We're going to put in the chat. It's Pamela underline Sneed on Instagram, which I recommend to all of you. It gives you a bit of a boost every day because Pamela is now also a visual artist for the last few years and puts that online. So Pamela, I'm gonna hopefully drive people to your Instagram presence. Um, the person who I'm equally thrilled to have today is Karen Finley. And Karen, thank you so much for really being the kind of motivation and instigator behind this event, uh, which we're just thrilled to host. Um, and uh, Karen is a professor in uh, arts and public policy in the Tisch School of the Arts at NYU. So she's a colleague and a friend. She's a writer, performer, a video and installation artist, filmmaker, and the author of several books, including Shock Treatment, Reality Shows, George and Martha, and the work Written in Sand, which also deals with uh, the victims of the AIDS crisis, a very powerful and moving work. And in 2018, Karen published Grabbing Pussy, uh, a, a work that addressed our moment in a way from her unique perspective. So thank you for being here and I'll hand it over to you and then I'll come back in a bit. But I am just totally thrilled to have, to have two, two of the most inspiring people who I know to uh, do this conversation. So you go for it and I'll come back in a little while. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Uli. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for the Center for Humanities uh, for hosting this event. And I also want to have a shout out to my department, Art and Public Policy, too, for, uh, for, for, for sharing and helping and supporting uh, my ability to do this, too, tonight. So thank you. And Pamela, oh my goodness, I'm so glad to be able to have this time to talk to you. And I think that what we're thinking about to start here, because we're you know celebrating this extraordinary book that you've done and Funeral Diva. And I, I think that let's let's start with you actually doing a reading from, from that book. I have it right here. It's fantastic. We'll be also putting links in the chat that you can can purchase the book. And it's also out with City Lights and Pamela and I work with the same editor, Amy Shoulder, and it is with City Lights that I've worked with. So we've had so many intersections. And, and so if, would you like to start by reading a, a book to give yes. our audience? Uh, well, 
first of all, I want to say thank you to you and to Uli for inviting me. Um, you're two of my favorite people, uh, great minds. Um, so I'm honored to be here. I want to thank everybody who's come out, you know, to support us and to hear us. And I want to give a shout out to Amy because she is Amy Shoulder. She's like both of our editors. Uh, she was my editor for Funeral Diva, and she's edited many of your books, Karen. And uh, and also she was a producer on the film Disclosure. And uh, and so that's a really important uh, film on Netflix. And so anyway, shout out and thank you to Amy and, uh, and to City Lights. And um, okay, so I'm actually going to start with... Um, some other things first, and then I'm gonna I'm going to weave my way into um, into funeral diva. So, eight minutes forty six seconds. That they would sit on a man's neck till his body, breath, spirit gave out. That they rendered him inaudible, voiceless. That eight minutes passed. Eight minutes. 46 seconds. It took days and citizens uprisings for the police officers involved to be arrested. That the news showed that one officer casually sitting on the black man's neck as if the man below were a deer, mountain grizzly, a bounty, a trophy subdued until there was no wrestling, no life left. That the great AIDS activist Larry Kramer would die days later that we all owe him something of our lives, that his memorial went on, that the chat closed before I could say again, thank you, Larry Kramer, keep fighting, before I could type George Floyd's name in the chat box, say the two were connected in the struggle for human rights. And these, uh, I'm gonna read two pieces and, and um, I wrote them, last year uh, during uh, April, I don't know, it was it Poetry Month? And um, I haven't read them too much. I think this is the second time reading them in public. So here goes. They're not now finding out COVID-19 ravages not just lungs, but also the kidneys, the heart. I'm thinking of all those families now, can and could not see their loved ones buried, could not say goodbye or all the lives that could have been saved with proper masks, gloves, respirators, preparation, and preparedness by our own government. If they hadn't fired the pandemics team two years ago, they keep saying COVID-19 is like the AIDS era. I beg to differ, it's nothing like that for me. Each is its own beast. Corona for me feels closest to ground zero, the shock, staggering losses of life. After 9-11, they were keeping corpses and body parts on ice in a Chelsea skating rink in case families had to identify parts. With the AIDS era, not only the hundreds and thousands of deaths, but they're forgetting the role stigma played, the queer factor. When a whole segment of the population was left to die, no one even acknowledged the crisis, a government and world that declared it was God's punishment against homosexuals, families that disowned, throughout their children's remains, in illness that tore families' communities apart, separated lovers. I wasn't even 30 yet, having lost most of my friends. Yes, there are things to learn from organizing the fight against, but please don't make shaky comparisons to something that you've never lived through or understand how the world hates homosexuals and queers, and for POC, it's worse. Thanks to the 1944 black and white film Gaslight, Starring Ingrid Bergman, where a deranged husband tries to covertly drive his wife insane by turning on and off the stove gas lights without her knowledge, which makes her question her own sanity. Thanks to that film called A Psychological Thriller, we can now name what the Trump administration did in 2020 to the American public, constantly lying, projecting, turning facts around, doing things that are criminal, nasty and fake as he calls it, but attaches it to other people, Obama, random women, reporters, the Democrats, attempting to divert responsibility and change the narrative. It's like constantly pulling rugs out, 
so that there's never firm ground to stand on. It's an extremely powerful form of warfare. It actually does drive me crazy when people say things like, oh, Trump's so stupid, such a baby, having, tr having tantrums like an infant, treating what is actually actual weaponry as character flaws. That's the only time I'll ever yell, that's what they want us to believe, but call it what it is, psychological warfare, which is an extremely powerful form of mental manipulation, thanks to the Trump administration we can now name, which is in itself a form of torture for victims or victim. Thanks to that film therapy and the Trump administration who brought it to the fore and mainstream, I can now name and see and identify this form of torturous behavior, the denial jealous and vicious people who project insecurities and fears onto the others, lash out, lie, pretend it never happened, blame, never take responsibility, get others to join in. That friend who befriends anyone you like or have issues with, tells you and waits, hungers, desperate for reaction. When you stand up, speak up, says you're sensitive or imagining stuff takes your ideas, language, words, pro projects as theirs. Thanks to that film and the Trump administration, I can now name, identify, not accept, speak. Okay. At the end, of every Holocaust film I've seen, and there are not that many. They show real life survivors and say the words never again. And some of us like me stare into these films down long tunnels of history, wondering how it could have ever happened at all. That a leader and his minions could be so toxic, so poisonous, you'd turn against your neighbors. You could be so oblivious, brainwashed, scared, desperate to be superior or to survive, you'd do anything or almost. They say, never again, but it is again. As I look at the deportations, roundups, I'm reminded of Idi Amin when he cast out foreigners and Forrest Whitaker in the film, The Last King of Scotland, when he played him. And to see it is again at rallies, at protests, they show the coat hangers and crude instruments women were forced to, you, to use in back alley abortions. We say never again, but taking away women's choices in Planned Parenthood, it is again. Today started out in an argument with someone who didn't understand why I mentioned race so much in my new book. And that white man is not the first, a black woman asked too. I wanted to scream, hello, haven't you seen the news? Didn't you see what happened to Stefan Clark, unarmed and shot in the back six times by police? And who even cares what happens to women, black lesbians, lesbians of color? There's no public outcry. A student once wrote to me in an academic paper that a parent forced her to stop playing sports because they said sports made her more of a dyke. It killed my student inside because she was an athlete. So the white guy I argued with about my books that he was just giving me some good advice from his experience as an empath. I said, I don't need your advice. I have reasons for talking about race and gender in the interpersonal. He said he was just trying to help me. I'll offer this non sequitur. Winnie Mandela died a few years ago. She had a great impact on me. I read she was nobility, but then the difference between her and how Princess Diana was treated, everyone accepted and loved Diana's silent passive status. She was allowed to be gorgeous. No one ever associated with her that dirty colonial stain. There are moments in the recent Winnie Mandela documentary that stand out to me, where she buried her face in her hands and she screamed out, as I have so many times I've been betrayed. The other moment was when she said she was the only ANC member brought to TRC and made to testify that Nelson Mandela forgave a nation, but he could never forgive her. What was done to Winnie is done to other black women and working artists, black women fighting to give language resistance, but it only matters when a celebrity says or does it. At Cape Coast Castle in Ghana, after you've passed the door of no return, there is a plaque donated to the castle by the black tribal elders. It reads, may we never sell ourselves into slavery again. But it is, again. Say what you want about my mother. I know 
Her cruelty knew no bounds, neglect, never a warm hug, kind word. Every year when school came fall, I looked at the flyers of back to school clothes, nothing. I wore rags, hand-me-downs. As soon as I worked, she made me pay rent. And that was the message engraved into me. Instead of being taught responsibility, I was taught I owed her rent, the ground I stood on and had no rights. My father's neglect, the patches put over his eyes not to see, never a book, nothing. She suffers from mental illness, is selfish, through blinds, uh, through stories I get glimpses. Say what you want, but she is the greatest fighter. She is going now. She cobbles out a life from women she watches on housewife shows, their competition. Her neighbor buys a wreath, my mother buys a bigger one. She tells my father when I visit, she drives up the barbecue. She buys corn, pretends it's a party. I see she has lost weight this visit, the depression. She believes there is a man coming to destroy things, that there are bugs. She constantly buys poison. I know I can't talk to her about depression, the drugs. So I say as gently as I can, keep your spirits up, then you'll gain back the weight. On the morning I am leaving, she dresses up in nice clothes and a pair of coral earrings I gave her. She said she'd been skipping meals, uh, but on the morning before I left, perhaps as a child just to show me, she piled her plate full of scrambled eggs with ketchup and she ate. I'm not sure why, but it's taken forever for me to write this poem. I hope to remember all the pieces, but I've developed a new condition. One that's come from age, I can no longer take the shit that I once did. And there's a part of my condition that comes from gentrification and cell phone use, living amidst tech zombies and their general fear and hatred of people of color. My condition is called sidewalk rage. It's kind of like road rage, but it comes when I'm walking down the street and there's some millennial who has just moved into the neighborhood who thinks it's theirs, a white girl who in broad daylight feels a dark presence walking behind her. It's me minding my own business. And she gets so panicked and paralyzed, she stops walking and holds her purse. With my new condition, I yell, if you don't want to live around black people, get the fuck out of the neighborhood. She's shocked. Or in another scenario, you see random white women on their phones standing in a doorway, completely blocking it because, you know, only they exist. And you're like, hello, hello. Yes, all these years, I thought I was still a small town girl. And then suddenly with my sidewalk rage, I'm a bonafide New Yorker, like the ones you've seen on bicycles banging on the hood of a taxi cab that tries to cut them off. My person with sidewalk rage is a character of their own, where once I was silent. Recently, I confronted a man who was blocking my path, crossing the street. He had his head down and almost rammed into me. I sucked my teeth really loud and I yelled, hello, hello, move. He was so angry, I confronted him. He yelled, suck my dick. I started to yell something profane, but I stopped myself. And then I was in the subway going downstairs and a white man rammed into me on the phone. My sidewalk rage kicked in and I thought for a second uh, to sneak behind him and kick him down the stairs. That's my sidewalk rage, but I stopped myself. I don't know who this person is in me who would never speak up for herself, was always soft and vulnerable, who's been at various times pickpocketed, blasphemed, body slammed, ransacked, ridiculed, who now has a voice who now lets rage show, who couldn't express herself, has now become all angles and sharp edges. I may attach this to another poem, and I may not. This may stand on its own, but these are my jokes. If you happen to go outside and you see some lady, some bitch on the street, 50-ish, coat open, it's under 20 degrees, don't yell, are you fucking crazy? Leave her alone, she's in menopause. Zero degrees, hot flash, and that shit feels good. And if you're on a bus or a train and you really need to sit down, find a black man, a big black man next to him, the seat is always empty, next to big black women too. Sometimes on a crowded bus to Boston, the seat next to me is completely empty. And just so you know, I'm in a rage about crudite, fuck, 
crudite. Who eats crudite except for starving first year college students at a book party? Really, what middle-aged person do you know is gonna chew hard on a carrot stick at a party? You're, it's not a barn. You're not a sheep or some shit. I mean, what about sensitivity to people with face, fake ass teeth? I looked over recently at an event and I saw some Brussels sprouts on a platter of crudite at a party. Raw ass, hard ass Brussels sprouts. No one is going to eat Brussels sprouts at a party. To my point, no one touched them. And politics has ruined my ability to enjoy Christmas or escape. I love Christmas. I watched Frosty the Snowman with my mother over the holiday, but then politics came in. I started questioning if the relationship between Frosty and the little girl who loved him was age appropriate. Why did they hug so fucking much? I mean, I know he's supposed to sn be snow, but why was he so fucking white? I mean, like hundreds of years of patriarchy, you can't get out from under. My new accountant, has tons of jokes. He's a black man. He said, the revolution is coming. And to those who say they don't serve blacks, it's okay because we don't eat them. <laughs> Law. Anyway, today, to be honest, I feel like Patsy in 12 years a slave, beaten for picking cotton. I mean, I like someone who is white. Their partner is white. They have stocks, trust funds, and a retirement plan. And I feel like fucking Patsy in 12 years a slave alternately known as Mammy. <laughs> okay. Size, color, class. I was never allowed to be little. By little, I mean innocent. By little, I mean allowed to play, make mistakes. If anything occurred in whatever setting, I was always blamed. I was mistaken constantly for being older than I was. At six, when my stepmother came, she refused to allow me alone time with my father. In a moment, if a moment occurred, she asked, what were you doing with him? As if at six, I were molesting my father. I was caught once uh, through an open bathrobe trying to see my father's penis. My stepmother never forgot. You were trying to look at him, she said. I was not given toys, books, anything, stuffed animals, bows, ribbon, anything that may be attached to a little girl. I was also my mother's sounding board for her adult problems with my dad, constantly instructed to call the police when he hit her. The only thing that the, my parents could figure out to do together for some small infraction was to give me punishment, two weeks. So I never knew the nurturance that girls got. My adult life has duplicated this, always to blame, outside, refusing to see my little girl. On occasion, my mother sent me to the store to get candy, things that she liked, fireballs, Reese's peanut butter cups, Kit Kat bars, black licorice, sometimes red, which I like, Twizzlers. I remember once chewing a pack of red Twizzlers as an adult. The red stem hung out of my mouth. A friend at the time exclaimed, you're such a little girl. And once when I was with a woman, someone looked on and said, oh, your little girl is out. In relationships too, I was never the little girl. In fact, in most of them, I rescued radically immature women. I was their mother, their caretaker, the one with all the responsibility. And of course, when it ended, I was always to blame. Everything to me lies around class, race, gender lines, even in so-called evolved communities, even with POC. I always know no one would treat a white-skinned woman or a man the way that I've been treated. In colleges where I teach, I'm always aware of hierarchy, people screaming about diversity. I moan, complain how the AIDS narrative only belongs to men. They never ask women, black women, as if AIDS didn't happen to us, our fathers, brothers, sons, nephews, cousins, acquaintances, the black gay boys in the choir became our, disappeared. I remember a pair of black gay men who were spiritual, would act as ministers and bury the dead black boys families wouldn't recognize. These men showed up as priests and gave last rites. And what of the women, a mother nursing a grown son returned to a baby ravaged by AIDS, me being young myself going into sick wards like leper colonies, seeing those abandoned by society, I never forgot. Even my era did not allow me to be little, innocent, a threat if I spoke up, a competitor for middle-class white girls who had the world handed to them and resented me, 
you for surviving, thriving against all odds. Born Freeze. I used to always write about a Sato saint slamming his hand down on the pulpit at Donald Wood's funeral when it was common to hide the cause of death of young men who died from AIDS. If they were buried at all and weren't abandoned, someone told me about a thin boy, thin with fear and death, played piano for the choir. No one touched him or talked about it. I know in my mother's family, her mother's sister said a parasite had killed her son when he died suddenly. But I remember once him coming out of a gay bar in Boston and all the white boys said, how do you know her? And I don't know if it was he or I who said, cousin, I'm his cousin. He made me promise not to tell anyone in the family I'd seen him there. So when they said parasite, I knew something didn't ring true. His mother, a seemingly healthy woman, died shortly after that. But I always felt their deaths were related. His mother, either from the lies or repression or a broken heart, having lost her young son. And I know everyone blames Jesse Smollett for his lies and staged attack, but it makes me think that there was something very toxic going on, that he didn't feel he could talk to someone, either that he was covering up a hookup or an addiction. Watching Asado stand up at Donald's funeral and tell the truth goes down in history as one of the bravest moments I'd ever witnessed. Either that or Audrey Lord spreading open the arms of her dashiki, the bravest woman we'd all witnessed, telling a crowd room of followers, I began on this journey as a coward. That or seeing a friend at the height of the AIDS era at a bar, his face covered in purple welts, refusing to hide, going out in public. That or Donald Woods being feeble, barely able to walk, accepting an award as a director of AIDS films or an ex-lover on a beach taking off her top and refusing to hide her mastectomy scar. Or when Denitra Vance performed at the public theater and danced naked, revealing her mastectomy scars, and Audrey refusing to wear a prosthesis. Or when Zakes Mackay and Master Harold and the boys in the first Broadway play that a cousin took me to said to his white master, have you ever seen a black man's ass and pulled down his pants and revealed himself to the audience? I was 16 years old. Or seeing my mother beaten religiously and still go out to work as if it hadn't happened at all, or even me, surviving so many tests, incredible tests. And once when I was talking to a doctor, I doubted my strength, and he looked at me incredulously, and he said, you are strong. And another doctor looked at me, my suffering, and he asked, isn't anyone there for you? And another said, you deserve to be taken care of. And today, once more, I am nursing my broken heart, caused by someone who betrayed was not honest. That in attending an event and asking white people to give up their seats to black people who couldn't sit down and seeing social justice in action. Yes, I often think of Asado for the important place he resides in my history, but today I am examining his tactics, pulling the tools off the shelf, dusting off the weaponry in an exhibit because today, I need to use what he taught me. Today, I feel that rough puff of rage, that continuous assault, and I want to stand up and testify, though I haven't been asked. I want to interrupt all the proceedings, all the places Black lesbians have been erased in silence, like looking down at a manuscript, seeing that they asked a young white woman to write about Black queer history when it's been my area of expertise forever, or only attributing 80s and 90s AIDS activism to ACT UP. I want the point of outrage not only to be the historicizing of AIDS, but the fact that women and Black lesbians have been erased from the dialogue when there were so many organizations like GMAT, Other Countries, Adoti, Men of All Colors Together, Salsa Soul, Las Buenas Amigas, and more, or asking where are all the Black lesbians on pose, because certainly we were there on the piers and part of that history. And why are white men constantly at the helm to tell our stories? And why don't white queers recognize this? 
that and seeing panel after panel being organized on history and art and all things important to the world and no one thinking and noticing it might be important to have a black lesbian present, just like they kicked Stormé out of the Stonewall narrative. And what about the people who weren't on the streets, but in jobs, fighting the system, the dykes and the queers meeting each other, forming community and connections and family and love just like in South Africa where they prevented intermingling, but ways were found. And each time we touched or loved, found each other in darkness and in light, it was resistance. Each time we told each other, you're beautiful, you're not wrong, it was resistance. When we stood up to the parents and the families and the courts and those that shunned us, it was resistance. When we wore what we really wanted to wear, it was resistance. Yelled at doctors and drug professionals, it was resistance. And every time we wrote and read poems, it was resistance. And every time some queer kid stays alive because they saw us, read us, discovered the archive, we've won every war, is fought on our bodies. And one day after the gender, racial, sexual orientation wars are over in America, there will be a new generation, just like in South Africa, called the born freeze. I'll read one more right. and, uh, and then we can stop and have a conversation and maybe I'll come back. So, a tale of two pandemics. The headline in yesterday's news blared a tale of two pandemics. Shocking inequities in the healthcare system. What got me was the use of the word shocking and two. Those of us who lived through the 1980s, early 90s AIDS crisis already knew about the existence of two New Yorks, two 20, 30, 40, 50 Americas, maybe more, depending on age, race, class, citizenship, status, entirely different systems for those who aren't white, straight, middle class. Those of us who saw our brothers, friends, sisters die at the hands of a system that shunned, refused to treat, threw away the unwanted, still can't forget a gay friend waiting for Medicaid to treat HIV. He got sicker and sicker. I asked why Medicaid took so long. He said they're waiting to see if I'll die first. That wasn't the America I learned about in elementary school. I was instructed to put my hand over my heart and salute. This wasn't the free America we sang of. People who are LGBTQIA already know that there are two Americas, a doctor who kept forcing me to take a pregnancy test. Even after I insisted at the time, I only have sex with women. I saw his scorn, still a test he made me pay for. And then those women who were forcibly sterilized, had wounds, their life force taken, left dry, barren by doctors who never even stopped to explain, felt entitled to take, scar women's bodies, breasts cut off, no options or consolation given. Women who aren't rich and white already know invisible lines you can't cross with no insurance or Medicaid, forced into black markets for drugs, a land of botched care, botched procedures. Black people already know Separate doors, separate entrances, treatments, options existing long after Jim Crow. And I have kept waiting for this moment, this time of a medical me too, when those who suffered from botched procedures in the indignities, indignity step from the shadows, speak and name the atrocities committed, medical malpractice. I won't blame all doctors, some are good, just middlemen like so many in a broken system doing what they can. And I'm grateful for the good ones in this pandemic risking their own lives. But the image of medical researchers that we see in movies and on television who understand a complex problem pour through medical books and science journals, stay up all night burning midnight oil to find a cure, who weep with concern are mostly false. Rare, like the ones who find cures and refuse to patent or personally profit. Those days have become a myth. What's replaced them are businessmen wanting status amongst peers, entry to country clubs and power, gaslighters, hustlers, actors like Trump. There is a doctor at Mount Sinai, star of his field, charged with drugging and raping his patients. No one believed it until it was proven. His victims were only black women. The rest he left alone. 
And uh, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> Can we give a, a round of applause to Pamela Sneed? Thank you so much. That was just magnificent. Um, thank you, thank you. How glorious and how generous you are with your spirit and energy and giving us that beautiful performance here right now. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. And the, I also want to thank you for all the energy that you give your work and that you're giving us here in this moment, because that was just extraordinary to, to be here with you and, and uh, just it's joyful. Thank you. So with your work, Mike, and where did it start um, is, I just, you know, I love this book so much and I, there's so much of your, every, your whole practice, you do so, you have the <laughs> book, you're doing your artwork and you've kind of, you started as a poet, but in this, this work in, in Funeral Diva, you kind of meld these different poetics and you go from, um, as we can be hearing here, right? So you go from your personal life, your own life, your own history, and and speaking about loss, and then going back, uh, uh, going in time from the AIDS epidemic and the loss and racism and uh, events of that time and era going back. But when you wrote this book, was this idea for the book? was before COVID and the events uh, with George Floyd and, and, and events that have been happening in this past year. And I wanted to know how is that, how, how are you feeling about that, of creating this work that, that resonates in terms of the events of that era and the era now from the 90s to now, or is it, is it the same? No, I mean, it's a really different time. And, you know, um, I mean, COVID is affecting like heterosexuals. And so that makes it a very different, you know, uh, uh, circumstance. And, uh, but I mean, people of color, again, are being like impacted most, you know, and, you know, people are saying things like, oh, you know, yeah, it's all going to be better when we have the vaccine. And it's like, but the vaccines are only going to white people. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. It's like, we need to address race, you know, uh, as well. We need to address class, you know, and we have to talk about how, you know, people can access this, you know what I mean? Um, and so, yeah, so I'm thinking about that because um, somebody was saying recently there needed to be, you know, actions around the COVID vaccine and getting it, you know, to people. And, uh, and it was a white person speaking and it was like, well, and I know that those actions really, it just means white people, you know what I mean? So it's like, we have to figure out how to address, you know, people of color, you know, um, and how to get medicine and how to get this healthcare system to be responsive, you know, to us and, uh, and to women. I mean, that's like really important to me in general, I think, women have been, you know, incredible victims of like the healthcare system and it's never been addressed, you know, and, um, and it has to be, you know, I just hear all these stories and, um, you know, and it's just kind of like, uh, we just like, I don't know, been at the mercy of men, you know, um, and now even like, you know, women doctors, I mean, they're kind of towing that same line. And so the, the whole system needs to be redone and it's always needed to be redone. You know, it doesn't work, right? Um, like so the, the system that. was broken already and now it's just, it's been revealed. Right, more. yeah. Oh, I mean, it's been revealed. I mean, it was like, you know, I think um, Chris Rock was talking about recently um, that his grandmother or something or his mother had to go to a, a veterinarian to have her teeth taken out. You know, she couldn't go to a dentist. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, like that, that's how the system, you know, um, you know, and then I remember another joke by him. I don't know, but it was like, he was, I went to see a show of his cause I like comedy a lot. I know you do too. And I love that. Right. And, um, and so basically I went to see a show of his and he was talking about Seabiscuit. 
and he was talking about Seabiscuit's shoes. And then he was like, you know, Seabiscuit being the horse, right? I don't know, you know, but he was like, at least, you know, Seabiscuit had shoes, you know? Oh my God. God. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. it's just sort of like, that's how, you know, I mean, that's a situation for people of color that's historic in this country. So it's not even being discovered, it's, it's been, it's been ignored. You know what I mean? Because it worked for some people. And now, you know, um, and then also, you know, Trump and his negligence. And I mean, it was purposeful, you know, it's like, you know, wiping out whoever he felt, you know, was was weak, you know. And um, so it's just kind of like, I mean, I call that like kind of like a genocidal campaign. I mean, what he did. Um, you know, and then I, I heard, I'm, I'm afraid to say things like that because then I think I sound too radical. And then it was like, it was really funny because then ba- and Billy Porter came out and said, ah, it's a genocide. So I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> they're saying it in the mainstream. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I think it's a genocide, you know. Um, and it's surprising to me how we just kind of take it. You know, it's just well, I don't think it's too, I don't think it's too radical and I think that your words and what you're doing are just are so necessary. And I think that this book that you have here should be required reading. And uh, I think we need to be hearing, you know, more of it. And uh, I think it should be part of the educational system. Your, your book should be required reading. Oh, thank you, Karen. You used to always teach your, like, I know, like, some of my students are here, and I know they can all testify that I've talked about you, or I've given them your work, so. Oh, well, thank you for your support. I, bringing up with humor when you're, and we both do use humor, and it does when you're, you, you know, mesh the humor and this, uh, place where you know irony that you use or these uh the sidewalk rage and all these places that you're using it but you did bring up a humorist uh a black comedian woman denitra vance and Mm -hmm. spoke about her i have to tell you i i did know her and i think that that was an artist who was just was so so extraordinary. I think she was the first uh, woman black comedian on Saturday Night Live as a cast member. And what an extraordinary talent that she that she was. And uh, I wanted to know, were you uh, did you know her? Were you friends with her? Or what was she? No, you yeah. know, it was like when I had first come to New York and she did George Wolf's The Colored Museum. Mm -hmm. um and she played the stewardess and then um in like one of the first solo shows that i ever saw was at the public theater and it was right before she died and she literally you know she stripped naked and she was standing on top of a black box and she had like day glow tape over Mm -hmm. her over the place where her breasts were and i mean it kind of like it blew me away like i had never seen a mastectomy scar i'd never seen you know a black woman in theater you know i just doing that and i guess it, something it was um i don't know if it ended up on the the front page of the times or something like that it was this really radical you know this really radical act you know um, and I think that I also write about her in America Ain't Ready that like how important she was and um, yeah, so she was somewhat like- Somewhat under-recognized and, uh, and so I, I just want to get her name out, out and for people to remember her and her incredible work that she did. Yeah, I also want to do, like, if I ever get, you know, I have, like, these academic projects, but then I also have all these, like, you know, creative projects. They're not separate, but but academia does separate separate them. And I always wanted to do a project on, like, uses of the black box, you know, and uh, and, and basically in theater, because it was, like, um, because Denitra used the black box, and then, you know, like maybe 10 years later, you know, along comes Robbie McCauley and, you know, does Sally's Rape, which, which was another piece of work, work that like changed my life forever. And like, um, and she, you know, strips naked. She just has like, a, she stands on top of an auction block 
Um, and she's talking about her grandmother's like, you know, or great grandmother's rape on the plantation. And, uh, and she has the audience participate in like the auctioning. So everybody has to say, you know, bit him in, bit him out, bit him in, bit him out, you know, and like she reenacts like, you know, slave woman on the auction mm -hmm. block. And it's just devastating, you know, so I'm interested. And then when I did Kong, I used uh, the auction block. And so it was a theatrical reference to Robbie and to Denitra. And I don't think that like there's been any documentation really of black women in solo performance and in theater, like documenting just the use of the auction block yes. and what that. I know that there is a, I think that there is a book uh, that's coming out, Robbie McCauley, uh, of, of her work and I think that that's another artist. And also Robbie McCauley uh, is an alumnus of, I think of Tish, uh, I think got their graduate degree there, but that's also for our audience to make sure to, to check out her work too. Yeah, no, I contributed to the book. So I'm, you know, I contributed to her book. Oh, you did, oh, wonderful. Yeah. We'll have to do some events for that then. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, really, really important. So some of these like theatrical traditions that have been like passed on and I try to like reenact them or I reference them, you know. Um, so I'm always like slipping in somebody's, you know, I don't know, somebody's name or somebody's work or trying to create traditions, you know. In, in discourse and responding to to work, that's, a, that's beautiful. and. I wanted to know, uh, what are you working on now? What are you thinking on? What are you, what are you planning? I don't know, you know, I've been like, you know, because my father died like, you know, two months ago. I'm so sorry, so, I'm so sorry about yeah. your loss, I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah, so thank you. Yeah, so um, I don't know, it's, I feel a lot, so I haven't been able to process so much, but actually there's a father poem starting to like shape up. And I think it's like an epic, you know, and mm -hmm. um, in the last couple of days, uh, you know, it's been coming out. So I guess like, you know, my writer is, is ready to start, you know, documenting, but yeah, I want to figure out, you know, I have like a big body of work. I have, you know, so I've been thinking a lot about revising a work that I did a while ago that was never published, which is America Ain't Ready. And I, you know, and I think Amy like wrote to me, what was it? Something, there was a text and you said, America is ready. <laughs> and, I, and I'm like, and that's exactly what I want. I want, I see the cover and it says America ain't ready. And then there's a cross out <laughs> flash and it says is, you know? And, uh, and I mean, we waited and waited for this, you know, moment. Um, and uh, it, it makes me think about like, you know, I was thinking about, um, Amanda, who's the girl that did the um, the inauguration poem? And, uh, you know, people were like, oh, if you didn't like it, it was like haterade and all this other stuff. And, you know, I mean, I thought it was an okay poem. I thought, you know, I thought it was great. I'm glad that, you know, like when Mandela got out, he had poets all around him and it was like, mm -hmm. they were wearing loincloths. It was fabulous, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's about time. You know, and I mean, there was Maya Angelou and all these people, but I also think that people don't understand like how long it's taken to get to this moment, mm -hmm. you know, to have this girl poet there, this dark skin, you know, poet, you know, speaking young, you know, and it's like a lot of like queer people have never ever had the chance, never mm -hmm. had the like, you know, uh, it's sort of like shoulders. I mean, she stands on so many shoulders, you know, but a part of me, as much as I celebrate, I grieve too, mm. you know, because, like I know that, you know, like 30 years ago, you know, if I had a shot at doing an inauguration, you know, who knows where, you know what I'm saying? And it's like a lot of us didn't get those shots, you know? And, um, and so it's not hate, it's just like, it's to understand you know, that, that basically that this has been a long journey and a lot of us opened up the road and a lot of people never have gotten to speak, have never had that chance, you know? And, um, cause it was making me think like, um, 
you know, like the Queen Latifah thing is coming out, I guess like she's playing a, um, you know, a detective and, um, and basically, and there's another black lesbian who's been cast in the role of 007. And interesting, I had said to, you know, a lover of mine like 30 years ago, I said, I want to play, uh, I want to do a film about a black lesbian detective. And it was 30 years ago, you know, and, um, and basically it was unheard of, right? And so, and so, you know, now it's going to be like, oh, this genius thing and like, you know, some white guy or Hollywood or, you know, we'll get, um, we'll get credit for it. But it's like, we weren't even allowed to like dream or to show our, you know, to show our brilliance. You know what I mean? It's like, I, like 30 years ago, I turned to her and I said, I want to do a film. I wanted to, I want to play a black woman, a woman detective, a black lesbian detective. You know, and that's the other thing that we've been kept out of. Uh, we've become, we've been kept out of certain, um, certain realms. So like detective stuff, you know, mystery stuff, you know, all things, you know, rom-com, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. like, you know, we only get to play, you know, like slaves and maids and, you know, different things. Um, I mean, it's changing a well, little bit. I like think you would, I think it'd be inc incredible to have uh, you as your as a detective, detective. Yeah, but it's so I was, you know, I was talking to someone yesterday. I was talking about like queer dreams and how we haven't because of you know society and stuff like that. We haven't been allowed to like dream or like you know now in the last five years I've been you know like studying painting and you know, collage and all of that other stuff. And then a black woman who was like teaching me, she's like, imagine if you had, you know, been taught to draw from the time that you were a child, you know, imagine if that had been nurtured in you, you know? So as much as I, you know, I celebrate the success and it's like, it's about time. I also grieve for all those people who never got the shot, you know? I, I hear you with what you're saying there and that complexity with that loss, but yet the celebration and the grief. But I hope that we're able to celebrate you here today. And I think that what I think that we want to have our audience have a lot of questions and I want to share this time with our audience too and also to ask Uli to come here too because I'm sure Uli has some questions to ask and thank you Pamela so much for sharing so much of you here and here's Uli. Thank you Karen, thank you, Karen. Karen and Pamela maybe I'll start out I, ha I have a, a personal question for you Pamela um, because the book really touched me but I, I someone put a question in the chat and said words can heal and words can harm. And can you maybe say a little bit about that? Is poetry a weapon or is it kind of a healing, a kiss or something like that? Sort of because we see words that are incitement and then we see your words. And what Karen said, you use irony and you have this, this book is a book of poetry and prose. It's an elegy, it's an autobiography. There's irony in it, there's humor, there's anger, there's activism. There's so many different layers. But I think the question is a really good one from Jim sort of, can you say a little bit about that words can both harm and heal? Well, I think I'm trying to, I mean, I think of, um, you know, it's interesting because I have like this ambivalent relationship about like religion and spirituality. I mean, my grandparents, you know, were, were my grandfather was a Baptist preacher and my grandmother was like the first lady. And, um, and so, and that's where I feel like I learned poetry. Uh, that's where I learned music. I learned everything, you know, that was, in, and I think the black church was a training ground for so many. And, uh, but one of the things that I've, been really positive about is that my work has been a form of healing and a form of spirituality like that's what I can get to you know what I mean like I you know I feel like art, like artists are spiritual workers you know that we're dealing with the heart you know um we're dealing with matters of the soul right um and so in that regard like I'm um I'm utilizing I'm purposefully utilizing my language to basically 
to speak things that may not have necessarily been spe spoken um, that I need to hear, that I feel others need to hear. So that my intent is really to convene with God or to manifest God. You know, I mean, if we're talking like Octavia Butler, it's like we create God, right? And so, um, so that is like my intent, you know? Um, and then there are people who want to kind of like, you know, manipulate or to, you know, um, what is it? Yeah, manipulate or again, who wants to, you know, control other people and stuff like that. Um, those are, that's not my intent, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, um, and I think, I think we have to kind of like look at that, you know, language that's employed. I mean, and, and there can be people like, you know, my family, like that are hurt, you know, by the truth of what I say, you know what I mean? Or what it is to like, or, you know, you, you make a comment about like an ex-lover, you know, who's like reading it and like, they're like that bitch, you know, how does she say that about me? You know what I mean? So, <laughs> um, but my intent is never to, to harm someone. It's always to try to, you know, illuminate the truth, you know? Yeah. I mean, thank you. It's actually very beautiful what you just said that you're also aware that you have to take this risk to say things that haven't been said, but they still may not be welcome to every community and everybody that even in your family, you may say things that are not welcome. Um, although you think you want them to be healing and creating something. And I want to go to a place in this book here. So I just for our audience here, Funeral Diva, and it's very personal. It really touched me. So when I was 20, my uncle died of AIDS and he was 44 years old, which is younger than I am. And at the funeral, uh, my mother insisted that his lover would be mentioned after which all of his colleagues walked past my grandmother and wouldn't shake her hand and walked out of the service. Wow. But I wanted to ask you something specifically. So your book is also saying women have suffered greatly during the AIDS crisis and people of color, and that's not really written in. So part of your book is correcting a historical record. And what I experienced, and this is the added part, I remember this so vividly as a young man at 20 that my uncle has just died. They are refusing to shake his mother's hand who lost her youngest son. She was 70 at the time. And wow. my, mo my mother does not remember this. So my mother said, what are you talking about? And I said, I was in total shock that people refused to acknowledge a mother's loss because they discovered at the funeral that he died of AIDS. But what was what's telling that my own mother today said, I don't remember this. So well, in some ways that, that, we, that the repression or the participation in a cultural narrative goes so far that, and I think it also did something to me. It said, if you die, you will die alone as a queer person your own family will actually not be consoled. And I wanted to talk a little, ask you a little bit about grief because you have a line, you say, there's massive grief remaining unprocessed. And what your poems are trying to do, because in this poem where this is from, this is on page 51, you say, I speak to it one person, one memorial, one funeral tribute where I did not speak. So in some ways I'm- Makes me I'm, cry. Yeah, it's really like, it's actually really, touching because you didn't speak at you know Don Reed's funeral but in some ways now you're speaking to him so now you're bringing him back to us and to make to actually for us to share this with you that you can now say something at a, where you also were not invited to speak right yeah that was like and I mean some of that may be hurtful as Donald Woods um who I was speaking about and I mean some of that there was like a, a great uh rift in like the black queer community because Asato, you know, got up and interrupted the funeral. And I mean, it was like, it was fabulous. You know, Asato is like, I mean, like six foot five, you know, when he put on the heels and, um, and like is wearing a man suit and like heels, high heels. And I mean, he literally sauntered down the aisle and like, I think the preacher had moved over to one side and like, there was Asato standing at the pulpit, like slamming his hand out and saying, you know, 
he didn't die of heart failure. He died of AIDS. And if you agree, stand up, you know, and like half the room didn't stand up, you know, and then the other half did. And I looked and Donald's sister, uh, Yvonne was actually standing. And, um, and that was like a good thing, but like, you know, people were like, how dare Osato do that. And that was really rude. And, you know, so for me, it was probably one of the most historic, uh, historic, but also heroic, you know, things that I'd ever seen. But like a lot of people did not feel that way. They thought it was rude. They thought it was, you know, and because Asada was like a big personality, they were like, oh, it's just all about him and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I thought it was like, I thought it was incredible. So that's like, that's sort of like a riff that was remaining. And then also for me to say that, you know, I wasn't invited to speak, you know, and, um, and that was like, that was something that I carried, you know, in my soul. Cause I was like, I was eulogizing like people I barely knew and then somebody who I was so close to, and then I wasn't invited. It was just, it was really hard and it was never right for me. And then, you know, actually, I think Greg was doing something at the Whitney and it was a tribute to um, other countries. And he asked me to speak about Donald Woods. And I was like, oh my God. I was like, are you for real? And like that, and he knew nothing of the history. So that was like really, it was really beautiful, you know. Maybe Karen could, since you've done written in sand, could you say something also about the un, the unmourned and all the deaths that, in some ways, I think Pamela it was very important. You drew this distinction between the AIDS crisis and the pandemic, but the kind of stigma that haunts people even in their death. And your both your work has been trying to to use poetry to say it is always bringing the dead back to life so they can actually rest in peace. And maybe Karen, you can say something about that, what your work has been to try to process what, what Pamela calls this massive grief remaining unprocessed. Well, even being able to respond, there's, there's such a cautiousness or there's just such a, a feeling surrounding that, that time and that loss that even that did you see that there's like this tension of going there and feeling it because it it's so immense for so many people and that the amount of people that were dying too that would be loss after loss after loss and then not being able to um, to grieve or to have a place or to have um, the space or then to see as Pamela is saying how families responded and not to be recognized and, and to carry that. And then when you love and care for someone and you want them to be, be loved or cared for and that you see that families uh, could not, could not, well, a nation um, could not, could not love in, in that way and to miss. And in, in that way, the immensity of what is happening now with so many people dying and not being able to grieve, not to have a place to. And that's not to be saying that there weren't places to be grieving. I know that's much more complicated in this short time that we're speaking about, but it stays, it, it stays with you and, um, and processing it takes many years. And that's why I, this book is so, so important for me and I think for so many people to, to understand your way of processing this and then also to be having with the, so many different lenses in that happening and, and, and to be able to take in that veil of, all, of this great weaving of, of the complexities of it. And it does, it does help me to be able to process my own grief but also to be seen where we are, we are now. Well, I, and I also want to say something about written, uh, written in the sand, because when I first became aware of that work, I was in London, and um, and it was a visual project, and it was showing somewhere in London, and you had decorated a chair with flowers, and you had um, filled uh, a room with sand, and basically, in that we would go in, and that we would write, you know 
names of people we've lost in the sand and, you know, sort of cover it over. And that's the first, I, and I mean, literally that stayed with me. It's in, it's in a story that I was writing about, but um, I don't, I didn't finish the story, but, but that piece, you know, that I saw in London, I think it may have been in Manchester that, um, you know, written in the sand when it was the visual work was, yeah, it was like a seminal piece. I'll never forget seeing it, you know? So yeah, I mean, you've always been, you know, part of my uh, trajectory of like, you know, learning and performing and speaking and, you know, all that. Well, thank you, Pamela. And thank you for this work that you're doing here and I've just, I'm so moved and you can see it's some, just the, the emotions that we all have. And, but you are, you bring so much into it of really speaking about the sexism and the racism that really occurred during that time that needs to be corrected. And it really does and to be restored. And it's so important that you are speaking directly to that. I don't think that my work really speaks about that enough. And that was wrong. And I think that your work is so much more important, giving it a larger picture of really what, what the story is. Well, I think there are aspects, you know, we write what we can. I mean, you know, again, like I teach your work because I feel like it's, it's really important. You know, it's really important for people to know. And I think that a lot of like feminist perspectives, you know, and I mean, I think that's where Amy comes in too, that you've like, I always, I, I always, um, I think of you like, <laughs> she's probably gonna hate me now, but I always think of like, like the home for wayward girls, you know what I mean? Oh boy. <laughs> and I'm like, like Amy. I don't hate you, know, you yet has nurtured like you know some outside voices and some you know women's voices and trans voices and like people who have not been heard you know and um and it's really important i mean you're a pioneer in that i thank you i feel very uh i think for our audience here is how joyous it is when you're an artist or writer and that you have colleagues and friends that you can be sharing and talking to. So um, I'm speaking to Pamela here too, but I feel very lucky that we, we get to be friends too and discuss our work and we share moments in, in that time here. Um, Karen, so I, wanted, I want to add one thing to what Pamela said. I think both your work, Pamela, you said it gives voices to people who hadn't been able to speak to be heard, who hadn't been given a platform. I think it also creates the space to imagine whole new beings. That's why Octavia Butler is more important. It's like, it's not just people who hadn't had the platform, people who didn't even exist, who didn't even know they existed in a way, because we don't know that we exist in a certain way until we actually come into our own. So in some ways it, that this is poetry, performance work, films, books you've written, that it actually creates the possibility for people to imagine themselves for the very first time, not just to bring people into conversation. Um, and there's a question here, another question. Someone asks Pamela, how do you navigate the balance, the public and the private? Where someone says you are, in, in quote, a strong, fierce lesbian, but then when you paint, something different emerges. I don't know, I think it's still strong, fierce lesbian painting, but hey, but I think you know what I mean. He's trying to see, to see how do you do, and because both of you are performers, and I think maybe that's a good question to say when you are performing and you also doing something for others, and then there's a private part, how do you balance that? Or is there a balancing question even? Well, I think that, I mean, I think that the vulnerability that that comes through in my, you know, visual work is also in my public persona, you know, I mean, it's also in my writing, you know, it's in my performance work. So I, I don't think it's that different. Like, I do think, um, what is it like sometimes 
you know, I use visual art, like sometimes I'm using it again as like protest and stuff like that. But a lot of time it's like respite, you know, like sometimes, you know, I was saying like the nap ministry for black women was so important, right? Because sometimes we, we need rest, you know, and, um, and that I rest a lot, you know, in my visual art. So sometimes like that, maybe there's a quieter me or another side of me um, because sometimes, you know, and it's not always, but sometimes I just, I don't want to contemplate, you know, something like really heavy. I'm like using it to just manifest something really sweet, you know? Um, but I, I hate to make those kind of divisions because I don't really, I don't exist that way, you know? Um, yeah, but I think that, I think that the vulnerability is always there. And then it's really weird. Like I have like this weird thing that like everybody, because of like my writing, like everyone feels that they know me, you know, like I, I get like really like, I mean, I get very intimate approaches, intimate, like, and that kind of freaks me out a little bit because like I spend most of my time alone, you know, <laughs> I mean, I've like, you know, very like, uh, I don't know, you know, um, I have like, you know, a handful of friends. So it's just kind of like, for me, like I'm so private in a way, but then it's like people have this sense of like, they have this all encompassing, you know, thing. Like they feel like really intimate with me, you know? And that that's a little strange. And that makes me like defensive, I think in the sense, it makes me quieter you know, like, um, so there's very few people that I feel like I can exist with all my, all my thing, you know, all my things. And then people who spend time to really get to know me rather than like making assumptions about like who I am or what I am, you know, just based on like, mm -hmm. you know, my books or something, you know? Yeah, no, that's really, Gives me a lot to think about. Karen, do you want to also say something since you also perform and you perform for all us? Well, I, I wanted to speak a little bit about Pamela's watercolors because you're recently, <laughs> that's sort of a new, been doing these beautiful watercolors, mostly of uh, fruits and vegetables, nature. And then you've started portraiture, self-portraiture. And what I... I'm responding to so much is that you're using watercolors and the vulnerability, but not being able to control, you know, the watercolors and that you have to flow this material. And then it's the struggle, but also the letting go and the joy of that, of allowing these colors to immerse. And I find that your, your watercolors are very poetic in that way and that it becomes exciting to see what is going to possibly happen so it isn't controlled in that same in the same way as like an oil painting or in something in that and then you're i also moved so much so everyone go and see pamela's uh instagram are your collages which is you know the fragments and the fragmentation and but the repair because the collage is this attempt to repair and to bring things together and I feel that that speaks to your own writing and to this piece, Funeral Diva, because what is, and I do have the word kind of sense of a gloriousness of your work, is because there is this feeling of the illumination, but the illumination of the possibility of this repair, like when you're putting it together and that you're taking off and that so it's like a collage too, because you have these different time frames happening in the past, in the present, in the future and bringing it and processing it, but they're fragments, but yet they become one own picture in itself in this, this, this container and that that is why Books are still so important that reading it and having and feeling the physicality of it, which actually these colors are so similar to the colors on your image here, of that containment and that that for me has like a restorative attempt in it too. And that's how it relates with your visual work. And you did do the cover of this too. You know, you did do the cover and, and painting yourself, which is sort of this opposite here that I don't know if you did that unconsciously or consciously intentional of having the pink and then the blue background, but 
this is oh. your self portrait and putting yourself in the in the blue the blueness and we all know what the, the significance of the color blue from the blues to the the meaning of it whether it's the depression the blues and all the great artworks that have been done with with blues and you are building on that i mean pamela the last poem in in the book why i cling to flowers gives us a little bit and maybe if it's okay karen maybe pamela you can read this poem because it's kind of a nice it's that also would be kind nice. of, and it opens on a kind of note that karen just mentioned and it ends on that note yeah, I would like that. I think Patricia Smith actually was here and was wanted to ask a question. Oh, can sorry. I, can I take that question? Oh, absolutely. Let me just see if yeah. I can locate it. I don't, uh, Patricia, let me just see. Patricia, are you still here? Have you, the question is, have you thought about a book of short fiction? Because your work is unflinching, sensory driven, lyrical and visual. Have you thought of a novel or other collaborations with artists, filmmakers, musicians? That's Patricia's question. Um, yeah, I am thinking about, well, I mean, Sweet Dreams, you know, too, like I go back uh, I go back and forth, like I'm talking about uh, the first novel I ever wrote when I was an undergrad. And um, and basically, and it was about uh, a blues singer. And um, I mean, so it's kind of like, and I mean, it was, I was 21 years old, you know, and um, I wrote this novel and her name was Jo. And, uh, and she was like cross-dressing, like, I don't know, if I, whatever, she wore men's clothes, you know? And, uh, and I mean, I wrote this, you know, and this was like the eighties and like, and, and, you know, and she was a dyke. And then there was like a science fiction element where she comes back to be, uh, she comes back, she goes through a time tunnel, uh, which is the unlit road and she becomes big mama Thornton. And uh, so I had this whole fiction thing or whatever. And I remember my teacher was like, you know, she's like, uh, what, but you know, this is a lesbian novel. You have to explain like lesbianism. And I was like, no, well this, I mean, she's a lesbian but this isn't what it's all about. You know what I mean? And like, and so my teacher was like, you know even 10 years before that you couldn't have written a novel about like lesbians without it being about, without explaining lesbianism having it all be about that, right? So um, so I started this fiction and then last year I got a commission um, from Deniston Hill and basically I decided to do the Big Mama Thornton project and uh, and like literally I was training myself singing I have some footage of like I, I performed with a band and brought the house down and I was performing Hound Dog you know by you know Big Mama Thornton and, uh, and it was amazing. And then the COVID hit and like the whole performance got canceled. I'm supposed to meet with them again uh, and like figure out when I'm gonna go back to that project. But the idea is, but then that fictional character is coming back into my performance, right? And uh, so it's this weaving of like fiction, autobiography, and then biography, like doing this whole thing of, of you know, Big Mama Thornton. So I've got big plans. Oh! <laughs> um, but yeah, I like fiction. Um, I don't know if I would do a book of short stories. I would probably write a novella. You know, I probably have a novella around the house, I'm sure. <laughs> but um, I don't know, you know, I'm like, I'm thinking about for the next one, I might do a series of short stories. I might do an epic poem. Again, I'm interested in America Ain't Ready. Um, I don't know, the floor is open. Yeah. So I'm gonna read this poem. Why I Cling to Flowers. I was trying to think of what it means, why I keep painting and posting flowers and trees in the pandemic. I know they're beautiful and they assert amidst any chaos and confusion life on the planet. 
Every spring, despite climate change, every natural disaster, purple crocus push up out of the ground determined. I'm fascinated by their colors, striped purple, violet, and white, red, blue, and yellow. I love that some humans place wire nets over them to protect their growth so they don't get trampled on. I sometimes think of Brooklyn streets as fashion runways. All the flowers model for humans trying to look their best in various poses showing off their blooms, each trying to outdo the other with fabulousness, like black women on Easter wearing an array of hats. I love pink, purple, magenta, magnolia blossoms, how each bulb occupies a separate branch looking and pointing to the sky like an elegant candelabra. I love the daffodils and red, orange, yellow faces. And one daffodil that I pass each day pushes its neck uh, through an opening in a metal garden gate. I identify with how it stands apart, how it breaks apart, stands separate, as if refusing confines of a cell. I struggle to understand what this all means why I cling to flowers. When the news feed reports COVID-19 death after death in fear, they say the pandemic most affects black people, migrant workers and poor brown people globally and the aged and those who have underlying conditions. And your friends are still dying from AIDS, even though you thought and hoped and prayed the worst was over. They say the next two weeks will be the pandemic's greatest peak in America. People are yelling and fighting in grocery stores on the street. There is so much fear. And the life you knew, good or bad, may never return. But finally, talking to my father today, I understood my connection to flowers more. Over the years, anticipating his demise, he's given me messages, said you never gave me any problems. You went off and you did things on your own. You did everything by yourself. You decided to go to New York and you never looked back. You've made it on your own. Today, we were talking about the pandemic. I try to find masks and hand sanitizer to send to my family. Touched and impressed by my efforts, my father said, you still look out for us. You're a beautiful girl. I'm glad you're my daughter. I'm here for you. And then I understand what it all means. If we can survive, have equipment, means, money, support, conditions, there are other, also other possibilities. We can heal. Thanks. Thanks. Hamla, I just wanna say thank you. And so many people in the chat said, thank you so much for the language you give us. So I just wanna uh, really say thank you on behalf of the Center for Humanities and for myself, thank you so much. I'm gonna give it to Karen, you can say something, but I don't, I, there's nothing to add for and, me here. Thank you, Pamela and everyone. Make, see if you get, get the book, read it. It is a joy. And Pamela, thank you for your generosity and also to the audience all for being here and just allowing this time to be here during this Zoom time. And I look forward to seeing you all in person and bodies. But until then, we have, we have wonderful books and readings and we have to have art and conversation to be here together. And this is a good place to start. Thank you so much.